gospel and turn to Job chapter 12. Job chapter 12. Job chapter 12. Job chapter 12. Today I'm going to talk about the traits of a successful minister. The traits, characteristics of a successful minister. Uh, there's ministers, been ministers ever since the beginning of uh, the church. Preachers, shepherds, pastors, uh, bishops. Um, and each of them, I'm sure, has, have had various characteristics and various things that have made them unique. Uh, but there are certain things that a minister must have and must do. And the Lord likens ministers to animals and Christians also, people, if you will. Uh, people are most like unto sheep, Christians in the scripture, and people are like unto fish. And I went through a whole thing, you know, where we can have ministers who are hirelings, who aren't faithful, and ministers who, who uh, feign themselves to be ministers and godly people, and they're actually wolves in sheep's clothing. But when you think about a minister, and for those in here that are aspiring one day to maybe be a minister, uh, there are certain things that you're going to have to you're going to have to endure, and certain things that you're going to have to just know that hey, God's going to have to work these things out. <clears throat> actually, while I was studying this. Uh, my sermons yesterday, I went online because I was looking um, at some of the things as to some of the occupations that produce the most a most atheists, because uh, I was interested in, in some point that I had. And when I got to this one site, it had a list of the 10, th 10, 10 things, occupations that will cause people to become atheists. And it was the weirdest thing. As I'm reading through, the first one was be a minister. And I was like, what? Be a minister. Then the second was, read your Bible through. And I'm like, okay, somebody's coming at this, an angle of anti-Christianity here. Well, the writer of the whole thing happened to be a minister, a minister who turned atheist. And if you study these things, there are ministers that actually, I don't know how it can be, but they turn away from the Lord and become atheists. And the reason he cited that he became an atheist was because he said he watched his church people over all the years and being around people, he said he saw bad behavior and he watched the people of the church. And there must have been a lot that happened in his particular church that turned him away from the Lord and actually made him not believe that there was a God. But um, he was very condemning of the ministry overall and says that it it will actually cause people to become atheists. Now, you know, I can understand some of the things that maybe he had gone through. I knew a minister one time that was devoutly against God. Um, you say, how can a minister be against God? Well, he was a minister and some traumatic incident occurred in his life and he could not forgive God and therefore he became anti-God. And that's really what happens. It's not that a person becomes an atheist. Um, once a believer in the Lord, they, they get to a point in life where something may happen that turns their opinion of God, and therefore they want to say he doesn't exist, when in reality he does exist to them, but they're just bitter against him. And that's where we need, need to all be careful as Christians. You know, we, we know that there's human suffering in the world, but sometimes as Christians, when God maybe doesn't answer a prayer the way we want it to go, and something happens that traumatizes us, maybe a premature death or something like that, or something just doesn't go right in your life. And the next thing you know, you're beginning to question whether or not God exists. And I believe that's happening a lot in the world. And I think that Christians are looking at the world and, and a lot is going on in the, in the world today. And people are wondering, and I'm just saying this openly because I know it to be true. People are wondering, where is God in all this? And why is everything turning sour in the world? And why is God letting it happen? I mean, I'm sure those thoughts have arisen in your mind. Um, and in talking with people, I know even in this church, there were people that 
that had a real hard time with some of the news and some of the reports that were coming out and just the state of the world. But you got to understand that no matter what happens in the world, man is sinful. Man is sinful. And that's where it all boils down to. The wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And with death comes decay, comes dying, comes all kinds of bad things that sometimes we have a hard time accepting that God allowed those things to occur. But in reality, God wanted man to be perfect from the beginning. Okay. So in looking at that, and I kind of clicked off later, but it stuck in my mind all day. And I was a little bit bothered that, you know, I even read some of that stuff. But when I think about the traits of a successful minister, you know, we have to be able to get through the difficult times in life. And as a Christian, you can apply some of these things to yourself. There are going to be rough times ahead for us. We all know that. But we have to stay faithful and true to God and trust that he's going to get us through the most difficult times in life. Amen? Man, okay, let's go to Job chapter, Job chapter number 12. <clears throat> it says here, but ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee, and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee, who knoweth not, in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind. So in God's hand is the soul of every living thing, and the breath of all mankind. So if we take another breath, it's because God allows us to because God gives us the breath, the air that we breathe. In fact, what king was, was rebuked uh, and told about his own breath coming from God? Anybody know? In the book of Daniel, the man whose knees smote, saw the writing on the wall. It was King Belshazzar, and it was Daniel who said to him, the God in whom thy very breath is, thou hast not glorified. So he, he told him, he says, every breath you have comes from God. And that's the way it is. Now, the Lord says here in verse seven, but ask now the beasts and they shall teach thee. I had a friend years ago in x-ray school. His name was Brian. And he was into a lot of, uh, a lot of fossils. And he loved studying fossils. And he come to me one day and he said, I want to show you a verse in the Bible. He said, is this dealing with the fossils and the fossil record? And is this what God is talking about here? It says, but ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee. And the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee, or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee. So what he was asking me was, can we learn a lot by the fossil record? And is this what God's talking about, asking the earth to teach us? Well, you can look at it that way. I mean, we can look at the fossil record. And the fossil record actually, actually puts evolution to rest when you study the fossils. Because when most fossils, and if you, if you know anything about fossils and the finding of fossils, it takes immense pressure to make a fossil. And when you have this massive amount of fossils in one particular place, which they call them fossil fields, and they found these things way up, eight, 10,000 feet on plateaus where these animals didn't even exist. Now that record right there tells you what happened. These animals left their habitation where they generally were and ran up to get away from something. And what they did is they congregated up in the highest parts that they could get to on the plateaus. And what's a plateau? For those who don't know what a plateau is. It's a flat part in the mountains. Okay, so you have the mountains. You have the jagged parts of the mountains, and then you have the leveling off that are called plateaus. These, these animals got together in these big fields, and there was rapid fossilization where they were. So if you said, this man said to me, can you ask the earth, and is it going to teach you? Well, if we look at that, what's the earth teaching us? Teaching us? What's it telling us? It's telling us that these things may not be as old as we think them to be. Well, you say, well, carbon-14 and all that stuff. 
in that dating. Yeah, but when you have pressure involved, you get rapid aging too and rapid fossilization. So you get all these animals that congregate onto this plateau. And the next thing you know, you have the upheaval of all the land and the water and everything. And all of a sudden a mudslide or rocks fall on top of them. And the pressure from the water pushes that all together. And before you know it, you've got fossils all over the place in these fossil fields, proving a quick devastation, whether through Noah's flood or another occurrence that occurred maybe back early in the book of Genesis, where it says, and the earth was without form and void. Okay, so you have this. So ask the earth and it will teach you. Ask the animals and they will teach you. Can you, can you know what people, can you know how people are going to act? And how can you learn about people's behavior? You can learn about their behavior by studying the animal kingdom. Now, when I was in sociology class, and who's ever taken a college sociology class? Okay, so one of the first things that they taught, and I, in fact, I think it was the first thing, they said, sociology 101. Here I was in this class. The teacher starts off and says, man is an animal. Who was taught that? Man is an animal, okay? And we are just like the animal. Is that true? Well, we're just like the animals in our behavior. The people act like sheep, do they? The people act like fish. How does a fish act? They go in schools, don't people like to congregate? Then you have your rogue fish. You know, you got all kinds of things. The Lord said, I'll come unto me and I'll make thee fishers of men. You study a sheep, just like the Christians, okay? In fact, we know that people will follow sometimes to their own destruction, other people, right? So will a sheep, so will a lamb, just follow it blindly, just follow, like people to their own destruction. And that's where Antichrist is likened to a shepherd. So is Jesus Christ likened to a shepherd? But Jesus says he's the good shepherd. Antichrist is what kind of shepherd? Come on. Deceitful, but what's the word say? What's the scripture say? Woe unto the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. He's a hireling. So Jesus Christ stays true to the sheep, just like David stayed true to the sheep. And I'm up here today as a sheep, but I'm also more than a sheep because God has called me to be a pastor. He's called me to be a shepherd. So how can a sheep lead other sheep? Well, I become a shepherd but I'm who sheep, I'm Christ. So you have Christ, the great, the good shepherd, and you have the shepherd, the bishop, the deacon, or the, um, the pastor put over, over the congregation, the minister. So it's the minister, the sheep, and the one guy wrote a book, he says, minister as shepherd. So I have to learn the traits of a shepherd. And one thing about a shepherd is a shepherd can't be in hireling. He can't flee when the wolf cometh. Example, example, David, okay? David, instead of fleeing and leaving those sheep to save his life, did what? He stood up to a lion and he stood up to a bear, okay? Now, speaking of those two, I can liken a minister to a lion. Say the characteristics of a minister. If you wanna be a minister one day, you're gonna to have to be one patient. Amen? And I think a shepherd has to be very patient with his sheep because you have sheep within the fold. You have all kinds of different ones. You have those that will sit with the shepherd and just kind of sit there and let him pet them. And ones that stay true and faithful to the shepherd all their life. But then you have others that are always looking into somebody else's field. Always want to go over to where they think the grass is greener over on the other side. And those are wanderers. And you got them, they wander out and then they'll come back and then they wander. And you could just study sheep. In fact, again, there's been books written about this and those that become ministers can understand how the congregation is gonna be by just even studying sheep. And in the Bible, most of the prophets, a lot of them and great men in the Old Testament were shepherds 
before they became what they were. In fact, the greatest king who has ever lived, David, King David was a shepherd, as I said, before he became king. So when he became king, he understood loyalty as a shepherd, okay? So let's think about some of the characteristics and traits of a successful minister. They need to have the strength of a what? Strength of an ox. You got to have the strength of an ox. You're going to be challenged. You got to have strength. So if you're, if you're strong in the Lord and you know you can be strong in the Lord, that's one thing you have to have. You have to have that strength in the Lord. And I'll tell you when the strength sometimes is really challenged. When you yourself fall to temptation. When you yourself fall into sin or something like that, and you kind of feel yourself struggling maybe with this part of life, your strength is tested because you got the whole church looking at you and you can't falter. And maybe you feel you have. You get on your face and you get that confessed and you try to get that right with the Lord and you try to, again, be strong and continue on and always try to go forward, not backward. Think about an ox when they're yoked with a plow. That ox can't go backwards. He can't kick to want to go back. What's on that plow? What are they called in the scriptures? They're called pricks. And they're on the, on the bottom of that plow there, and they stick this way. And when that ox wants to kick, what's he hit? He hits those pricks, those very sharp, pointed, whether they're made out of metal or wood or whatever, they hit them in the legs, and he knows, oh, that hurt. Don't do that again. And sometimes we want to kick, we want to try to go backwards. But the Lord, we're the beast of burden. Got to have strength, okay? Now, in the Old Testament, the Lord wrote a verse, and it was Paul who took off from this verse. Anybody know what the verse said? Let's go there. Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25. This was just a short verse written here in Deuteronomy 25, but boy, it becomes a, a big thing in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, you had prophets and you had priests. You didn't necessarily have ministers. But in the New Testament, the prophet and the priest became bishops and deacons and preachers, ministers. So there was a little changing for the church in the wording of this. Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse number four. Now, if you know your New Testament, you would know what this means in a spiritual sense. But in the, in the physical sense, in the doctrine, you say, what's the application of this? It actually applies to an ox. So what you don't want to do here is verse number four. It says, thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out the corn. So when the ox would tread out the corn, they would use him and they would put a yoke on him. And this ox would go around in a circle. And he would tread on the corn. And they would use the strength of that ox and that beast of burden there to tread down the corn. Well, the whole time he's working, if he got a muzzle over his mouth, isn't that unfair to him? Because you're not letting him partake in the fatness of the corn, in the tastiness of the corn. So the ox is encouraged by just being able to stop every once in a while and taking another mouthful of the corn and chew it up, maybe stop, just catch a breather and then start again. If he gets hungry again, stop, eat a little bit more and keep on going. If he wasn't able to eat, how would he get the strength? So do I need you to strengthen me? Am I yoked with this church? I absolutely am. And in my heart and in my soul, and I've told my wife this many times, I'm married to this church. In my heart, and I'm not saying this as a Catholic, how they talk about the nuns and stuff, but they do that too. The nun is married, the priest, and they're, they celibacy because they're married to the church. I don't believe in celibacy as a minister. I believe that a bishop should be the husband of one wife, as the scripture says so we can avoid temptation, and so that we also can counsel 
I mean, how, how, how weird is it for you? Uh, think about it. a married couple goes and counsels with a priest and says, you know, we're having trouble in our marriage and we wanted to come talk to you. What kind of authority is he? And, and if I was, I'd say, well, my wife convinced me to come, but I got to ask you a question. Were you ever married? No. How can you understand what I'm going through? Right? But if you come to me and you say, Pastor, I'm having trouble in my marriage, will you sit and talk to my wife and I? And I'll say, sure. And then you say something along the lines like, well, you know, I just, all I want is a good dinner when I come in the door at night. I just, I have to make my own food. I, I just, one time, I just wish that she would just make me a nice dinner. Now, as a married man, can I understand that? Can I? Or my kids, they just drive me crazy when I come in the house. I can't even get in that house and, and sit down to even get my work clothes off before they're hanging on me. I want to go to the park. I want to go to the swings. I want to ride my bike. A man who doesn't have children can't understand that feeling. But when you've experienced it, you can go through it. So as I said, I've often told my wife, I feel like the church, I'm married to it. I feel like the church is my child. I feel like the church is my mother. And oftentimes, as the church and the needs of the church and the burdens of the church are upon me, sometimes the others in my life kind of get put to the side. And that's just the way it is. And for those that are going to one day be a minister and get in the pulpit and get a congregation, you're going to understand that the demands of the church, and not that I don't want it. And I'm not saying that to complain at all. I love it. I love it. And I love you. I'll tell you that I do. And if you needed me at four o'clock in the morning and called me, I would be there for you if I humanly could, because that's the way I feel about it. And I hope that I always feel that way. I hope I never don't feel the way I just said, because if I do, I might as well just quit because I, I have to feel that way. But as an ox, you get that yoke on you and the yoke of the ministry. But can you strengthen me? Yes. Well, what does Paul say about this? What's this all about? Why did I go here? And how is the minister like an ox? Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox. What is that? We just have this little verse here, but Paul expounds. He expounds a lot on this. Okay, let's go. Um, so the minister is like an ox. Let's go to two passages, 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy. 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy. 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy. First Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9. And 1 Timothy chapter 5. First Timothy chapter 9. And look at or 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 9. Okay, so Paul quotes this and actually takes it from, a, from the ox as an animal and puts the ox in here as the minister. So we know that a minister is like an ox, definitely, from 1 Corinthians 9, verse 9. For it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen? And the reason God wrote it is because he was taking care of the oxen. He was saying, get that muzzle off that ox's mouth because he needs to eat as he goes. Okay, God takes care of the oxen. Okay, now look. Or saith he altogether for our sakes, for our sakes, no doubt, this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? So what am I sowing to you today? Spiritual things. And Paul was saying that the minister will sow the spiritual things. So in return, what does the minister get back from the church? What does he get back from the church? Oftentimes, some spiritual things, definitely. But Paul is saying the minister sows the spiritual things. And in return, God set it up so that the minister would get the carnal things in return. 
congregation would take care of the minister. Okay, that's, that's what Paul's saying, and that's what he's expounding upon. He's not saying, hey, it's not totally about the oxen, but God also put the minister in the position of the oxen that the minister's going to tread out the corn for you, going to tread out the word of God for you, going to break it down for you, going to build you up spiritually. And that's where church is so important. Because if you won't come to church, the minister can't help you. Right? And if we have three services in a week and you only come to one, you're only get a, getting a third of the help. You're not getting that help. So when the church doors are open, where should the sheep be? In church. Wouldn't that minister to me? What is easier? For me to preach to one? What's more encouraging? For me to preach to one or preach to everybody? For me to preach to an empty church or a full church? Because when you preach to an empty church or just a few handful of people all the time, you get discouraged. And I'm telling you, for those that want to become a minister, you're going to have your lean time. My dad often told me, he said, the first year that a man becomes a minister, it's often referred to as a minister's honeymoon. And again, he likened it to a marriage, the honeymoon. Even in the Bible, it talks about a man when he gets married, that he should not go to war. He should do what? For a whole year. Stay home and basically cheer up. Cheer up. That's what it says. Cheer up his wife. That's what the Bible uses, those words. I'm glad you said that. Cheer up his wife for a whole year. Don't do anything. Stay with her. That's the honeymoon. And then after one year, what's the tradition? Come on, Rose. After one year, what do you do? Anybody? Wait, wait, Kathy, some of you older ones here, Ben. what do you do after the first year? Have you forgotten? Wait, 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 don't. After, all right, my wife's got her hand up back there. Help your mother out. You eat the wedding cake. Did you do that? Yeah, yeah. So after you say, got to save a piece of that wedding cake, and you put the wedding cake in the freezer, and after one year on your first year anniversary, you pull that wedding cake out, and you and, your, you and your honey sit down and have wedding cake together. That officially ends the honeymoon. Who, who knew that? Come on. Which one? How many men knew that? Okay. We got, Sean knows that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and he's not even married. Praise the Lord, Sean. Amen. See? See? He's got that sensitive side over there. Okay. All right. So you know that. That ends the honeymoon. Okay. So as my dad always said, and he told me many times, he told others, hey, for the first year, it's going to be wonderful. The church, being a minister, you're going to feel like you're on cloud nine. And isn't that the way it is with a marriage? Yes, no, maybe. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Okay. It should be that first year should be your best year. They say, well, yeah, but then you get up to the seventh, seventh year and, you know, get the. It's that a seven year itch. Okay. Seven year itch. And then from there, I don't know what happens, but anyway, so you got the, the ox treading out the corn. Don't muzzle the mouth. Okay. Carnal things, and those carnal things are, they can be a salary, they can be anything. I mean, you think about it, it can be, hey, pastor, we got together, and I'm not telling you to do this. I'm just, this is where I get a little bit uncomfortable when I talk about it, because I'm not asking you, but you get together and you say, hey, pastor, we got together, we want to send you and your wife somewhere for, to get encouraged. We want to do something for you. Hey, we got together. We want to send you to go for dinner or to go to a hotel or something like that. You know, just to take a, a breather, go on a little trip. Or as you do, surprises. Hey, I, I made this pie for you. I made this for you. I, you know, it's okay. Those, and again, I get uncomfortable talking about that because that's not why I became a preacher. And if you want to become a preacher for that reason, I'll tell you don't because that doesn't always happen either. 
okay? And for those that are expecting this, a lot of people think getting into the ministry, I'll be rich. Pick another occupation. <laughs> You'll be blessed. But if you're looking for carnal dollars, ching, 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 no, no. The average minister isn't Benny Hinn. The average minister isn't, who's the guy who always smiles? Joel Osteen. The average minister isn't those that have their own private jet and everything else. That's not suffering for Christ. And hey, God could do that. But, and I don't mean to say, I'm not going to throw stones at them, whatever. The Bible says about taking railing accusations, if they're whatever, that's between them and God. But I just know that when you get into the ministry, for the most part, you're going to be you're going to be struggling financially unless you have or bivocational for the most part. But again, I've talked to other ministers about this and you just accept that, that that's part of life. But anyway, as an ox. Okay, let's go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And let's look at verse 17. <clears throat> so the minister should have the strength of an ox. 1 Timothy 5. And look in verse 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And I'll tell you this much, as a minister, you're going to give up some precious time in your life because you're going to have to study. And you're going to have to prepare. And that's always going to be. You're going to have to, you want to bring fresh material to the pulpit. You want to bring fresh meat so that the congregation doesn't feel that the, the, the diet they have is stale. I mean, who wants to eat the same thing every day? You don't, you don't want to eat the same thing. You know, if you had steak every day, as much as you love steak, you can't do it every day. Okay. So in verse 18, for the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn and the laborer is worthy of his reward. Okay, so whatever the laborer gets in return, God said you're worthy of that. So if the congregation decides to do something to the faithful minister, the Lord would say you're worthy of that. Because if you don't, and as a congregation, and again, I'm not telling you you have to. If you don't, you put a muzzle. And this is something that churches nowadays, and I had one person say this to me. They said, I know you're sincere because... You do this out of the goodness of your heart. Yeah, well, I do because God called me to do it. And I understand my calling. But at the same time, if a minister is not getting anything from the congregation, what they're doing is, and I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about the world right now. And I'm talking about other ministers who have said things to me. You don't want to put a muzzle over their mouth. You don't, because now they can't eat. Their, mu their mouth is muzzled. But anyway, my whole point on this first one was not to rebuke anybody. It's just to tell you for those aspiring young men in here, or even older men who would maybe one day want to be a minister and would become one, you're going to be like an ox. You should be strength of an ox. What else should you have? You should have what else is required? Looking at your faces. Yeah, but we're talking about likened to an animal. You need wisdom. But I'm looking at your faces right now. And sometimes your faces can intimidate my face. Well, I better not say this because, oh, well, you're looking at me right now. You need to have courage. Right? You need to have boldness. You need to say what God has told you to say. And sometimes that's easier said than done. So you should have the boldness of what? A lion. Okay. Strength of an ox. Boldness of a lion. Anybody know the verse? I'm going to help you remember this. Who likes guns in here? Who likes guns? Come on, just be honest. I mean, this is on tape. Pat. You like to go out and hunt. You like to shoot. We have cops in here. We have others. We have people who like to hunt. Okay. You can remember this verse, and this is how I remembered it. The first deer I ever took, I took with a 30-30 bolt action. It was a, a gun that was lent to me 
by Mr. Anderson. And I took my first year with this Revelation. And I don't even know if they make this brand anymore, but weird. Revelation 3030 bolt action. It was about seven o'clock in the morning. In fact, I think I got the first deer in all of Beaver County. Remember when he used to put them in the paper? Deer report? Yeah, they did. They did. And everybody wanted to get in the paper as the first one. It was just barely light. And in fact, I put the time to be a little bit later because I was afraid I might get in trouble because it was so early. <clears throat> but I made clearly made the deer out. It was a half rack. And he come out of a cornfield right out here in Potter Township, come out of a cornfield and he was jumping down. He stopped. And when he was running, I turned back behind me and I got my bead on the deer and shot. And I shot and killed the deer and pulled that out. I would have had the first year, but I reported just again, just a little bit later because I was like, oh, I'm getting trouble. But that was when I was 16 years old. My point is a 3030 is a caliber. So why did I say that? Because the verse that talks about the boldness of a lion is found in Proverbs 30, 30. So what I have here is an animal and the caliber of the first deer I ever shot, 30, 30. And that's how I remember Proverbs 30, 30. Boldness, the boldness of a lion. We'll go to two passages in Proverbs, but I wanted to say that one so you'd always remember that verse. Proverbs 28, 1. Proverbs 28, 1. And Proverbs 30, verse 30. Proverbs 28, 1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Okay, so the boldness of a lion. How do we know lion is king of the beasts? Because God said so. See, man borrows from God. God says the lion is the king of the beasts. And we know it by Proverbs 30, 30. Okay? A lion, which is strongest among beasts, he's king. And turneth not away for any. A lion, a minister, has to be bold. Was David bold? Was Jesus bold? Were all of the great men of the Old Testament who were likened unto shepherds bold? They absolutely were. You have to be bold. You have to stand. You have to stand for what you believe. And I'll tell you what, you might have that determination and desire and get up in front of people. Next thing you know, who's ever been up in front of people and knows how difficult anxiety can be? Who's got that in front of people? Say, man, if I gave a speech and if anybody in there went, or if they pointed or if they whispered, you'd be like, they whispered about me. Maybe I said the wrong thing. And next thing you know, you're, you're, you're just worked up, right? Well, try to speak to a group of people who don't want to hear what you want to say. Now, oftentimes in these four walls, it's a little bit easier. But here you are at a funeral. Here you are at a wedding. And everybody's happy. And the pressure is on you not to spoil the day. <laughs> but you know deep down you want to preach on hellfire damnation. Oh, that's a piece of cake, Pastor. Oh, come on, Pastor. That's easy. They expect that from the minister, do they? What do they expect from the minister? Lovey, kissy, huggy. Something soft, easy, light. Don't tell me I'm going to hell at a wedding. Don't you dare say in those vows to love, honor, and obey. <laughs> oh, it's easy. It's easy when you're sitting there. When you're up here. Ooh. Strength of an ox. Boldness of a lion. What other animals? Harmless as a dove. Ooh. But wise as a serpent. Okay, and I got... That, that is like weird. A dove and a serpent in the same passage. You're going to be like a serpent? I mean, like a, a rattlesnake is nothing like a dove. 
In fact, we talked about this the other day. I think the two meanest critters on God's green earth is a wild hog. They're, they're, they're nasty. And a rattlesnake. Like anybody think of anything meaner than them? A what? Okay, let's add him in then. <laughs> <laughs> okay worse than a wild hog i guess what else me the honey badger dingoes wild dog wolverine 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 endless energy pound for pound my dad used to say that wolverine is tougher than any animal but i'll tell you what it's harder to be meaner than a hog a wild hog okay all right we got all kinds of meaning <laughs> That's what I like. Give me that. Okay. So we got harmless as a dove, but then you got serpent, which isn't very nice, but they're wise. So a minister has to be, and a Christian has to be wise like that serpent, but harmless like that dove. Okay. Um, they got to have the vision of an eagle, right? The vision of an eagle. It's my responsibility to take you to the next level. But if you won't let me, I can't. I've had people who just can't follow me. And I said to them, you'd probably be better off going to another church because you simply just can't follow me. When I was younger in the Lord and the older men that were around me, it was difficult because they watched me grow up. The Bible says a a prophet hath not honor. Where? His own country, his own town. It's difficult. Jesus Christ was not liked by his brothers and sisters. How can I be expected to be liked by and to be led by? Very hard. It would have been a lot easier for me to pick up and go to Colorado or Wyoming or New York or Maine or somewhere where nobody knew who I was. That's what Jesus was saying. You realize how hard it was for my dad to start this church in his living room in the very town that he grew up in? Very hard. And very hard to pick up the torch by his son who grew up with the same people. Very hard. And Jesus said that. But carry you, bear you on eagle's wings. Where does the eagle fly? way up there and he can see everything below god wants us to be above the earth not on it he wants us to be up here looking from up here have the vision of an eagle i need to have a vision without a vision the people what perish got to have a vision we got to have a vision it's my responsibility as an ox to bear the burden but as an eagle to put you on my wings and carry you up here so you can see above where God wants you to see. And finally, this is the one I came up with. I got, I, a lot of, I got the idea from, from a little article somebody gave me, and they just listed these animals. I, I threw a lot of them out, but I kept some of these. This one here, I thought to myself, this is one I've always wanted to throw in here. Need to have the obedience of a the obedience of a type of bird. The obedience of a type of bird. And I want to tell you, this bird is going to haunt people that go to hell. This bird is a godly bird. You got a bird that can be devilish and a bird that can be godly. What is the bird? It's not the sparrow. But the Lord said, consider the ravens. What were the two birds that Noah had? He had a white one and a black one. He sent the dove out. It was faithful to come back. He sent the raven out. The raven never came back. You say, there, it's an unfaithful bird. Is it? 
What did God command the ravens to do? The obedience of a raven, did they listen? Bring that prophet his meat. Feed him. He didn't command the dove. You would think he would have called them. He commanded the ravens. Ravens are involved in judgment. So you got this bird that the minister's likened to that's supposed to preach judgment, condemnation, but also have a godly side to his preaching. It, well, I'm not saying a godly side because that is too, but have a softer side. But yet also we know that a raven through judgment will do what? What's anybody on a cross fear? Getting their eyes plucked out. Those that were on the crosses, the ravens, first thing, suck that eyeball out. Bible says the ravens of the valley, for those that are rebellious, ravens of the valley will pluck their eyes out. That's what it says in the scriptures. I don't have time, I'm running out of time to get into all about the ravens, but God speaks to them early on from Genesis. The obedience of a raven. Consider the ravens. He brought Elijah food. They're associated with Christ. Song of Solomon 5. In what way? His hair is black as a raven. Black as a raven. They're associated with the damned. With the damned. Isaiah 34 verse 11. Owls, cormorants, ravens associated with the damned. Interesting stuff. How God puts all that in, uh, into the scriptures. And finally, I have to have the devotion. I have to have the devotion of a what? I'll leave this on you. I have to have the devotion of a, an animal. I got to be devoted to you. If anybody messes with you, they're going to mess with me. Devotion, not a dog. Come on. Come on. Mess with the offspring. Ah, oh, there it is. What's the Bible say about a mother bear? As a bear robbed of her whelps. Okay. It says, let her meet the man. Okay, let's look at that real quickly. Let's go to Proverbs 17. Proverbs 17, verse 12. I need to have the devotion of a mother bear. <clears throat> Let a bear robbed of her whelps meet a man rather than a fool in his folly. Shows you how bad a fool can be. That the Lord would say, instead of a fool, It'd be better for you to meet a bear robbed of her whelps. What happens when you get in between a bear and her cubs? You don't want to get in between a bear and her cubs. You don't want to. And in fact, she has killed male bears when they try to mess. That's how fierce a mother bear can be, devoted to her children. I should be that devoted to you that if anybody would mesh with you, it would be like messing with a mother bear. Okay. Let's take a break. I went over a little bit. I'm sorry.